dear friends, this right here is love. Not that we loved God, but still he gave his son just to save us, a sacrifice for us. And since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. And if God is love, whoever lives in love, lives in God and God in them, so I'm and if you don't know love, and you don't know God, let it change who we are. Yo, guys. Hey, um, man, we're in this series called Acedia, and it's this word that means slothfulness or apathy or, man, an inability to do the hard work that love requires. And so we're, we're looking at primarily this passage in 1 John. Um, in 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And it goes on to say that he's made his love known to us by coming and being our savior, Jesus Christ, the one who comes and pursues us and lives the life that you and I couldn't live to pay the price that you and I couldn't pay so that we can have a right relationship with this God. And this word acedia is very, very applicable to yours and my heart condition most of the time. It's just like kind of the word that puts a uh, language to what our generation is, is struggling with. It's, it's not, it's not depression. It's not um, this like anxiety as much as it's this, this man, this angst in our soul that is unwilling to move and unwilling to do difficult things. And so, man, this has been a season. Your guys' last couple of years, some of you as freshmen, some of you as sophomores, has been wild in what the world has, man, pushed you through as men and women with school, with family dynamics, with a pandemic and how you guys have responded to all of this stuff. And, and by by all accounts, you guys are probably tired. We're, we're all probably tired and worn out. And in a sense, feeling this word, acedia, unwilling, un, undesiring to do any of the hard work necessary to get out of a funk, so to speak, to, to push through, to do, do the hard work that love requires, namely in our relationship with God. And it's really tempting and it's really easy for us to just sit back because the world has sort of been on pause. I remember when the pandemic kind of started like in March of 2020 and we all thought, oh, like two weeks and so many of probably you and so many of your peers and your friends were probably like, hey, this is kind of like for me growing up a snow day. Like it doesn't count. It doesn't matter. Like we get of this vacation, we get this pass and that stretched and that stretched and that stretched. And then you guys were looking at probably doing a lot of your schoolwork online. And, and for some of you, it may have been like, you know what, this doesn't really matter. I'll catch up in the fall when we really start school again, but this isn't really school right now. And that's, that's a good picture of probably this word. I don't, I don't feel like this doesn't really count. This doesn't really mean anything. And that's kind of how some of us feel about our lives or whatever season we might find ourselves in, whether it's with family, whether it's with school, whether it's with sports, whether it's, hey, once, once I get to this season, that's when life starts. And God, we've been looking at, God is a God of love. God is a God who blows this word up and he does the hard work that is required from the very beginning. And so on Wednesday, we kind of had this attempt of looking at scripture from the whole, the big story of how we have a God who is from the beginning been pursuing us through a people, through Abraham, this old man, nomad, toothless guy who was living in the desert and God calls him out and calls his family and Israel and then Jesus and these kings. And, and maybe this is all language that's unfamiliar to you, that's okay. What, it's, what I want you to walk away with hearing is that there's a God who from the beginning of time has been working to break into this feeling in your life and say, I am a God. I am the God who is worthwhile and working 
to bring you to a working knowledge of myself. That's what he's doing. And so I want to share this story. I, when I first um, met my wife, we met in college and we were just friends in college and we didn't really have eyes for each other, if you know what I mean. Um, I actually had been dating her roommate and that was a whole thing. And um, man, it's a gnarly story. I won't get into it now, but it's kind of funny and just God's grace and love. It's my story. It's not everyone's story, um, but I'm just, I'm thankful for how God worked in, in this. But so all that to say, me and my wife, we knew each other and then we got married two years after college and, and our first sort of Valentine's Day together, I was like at work and I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something nice. I'm going to get her roses. And so I drive to the grocery store. There's a grocery store in North Carolina called Harris Teeter. I don't know why it's called that, but that's the guy's name. And um, he sold sold, still sells a lot of things, roses being one of them. So I pick up some roses, I pick up some chocolates and I come home and I'm expecting to, to like, to like, wow, Carissa. And she's like, oh, these are nice. See, roses are not Carissa's favorite flower. And I did what every guy does on Valentine's day. I got roses and chocolate. And I said, hey, let's go out for dinner. That requires zero thought, gentlemen. That required zero work. Yeah, I had to stop at the grocery store on my way home. But I may have thought, like, I'm going to love my wife well by getting her these things. Problem is, that's not how she received love. And I actually communicated a lack of love in my attempt to love because my love was selfish, not genuine, not desiring to actually bring value to my wife in the moment. That's hard to hear, right? Like I, I wouldn't have said that to you if you were to ask me, I wouldn't have been like, well, I'm just a selfish jerk and I don't love my wife. So I'm going to pick up chocolate and roses for her. No way. But as I reflect now, and I think now, and after learning my wife more, I realize and I've learned that to get her red roses is cheap. She likes different types of flowers, all different types of flowers. I could have gotten her just a random bouquet that was probably significantly cheaper, but she would have liked it more because that's what she likes. And see, sometimes we, in our relationship with God, we think, hey, if I love God the way that I want to love him, then he should be good with it. He should be cool with it. The problem is, is that's not actual love. That's selfishness. And you and I both know in our own personal experiences that when someone does something that is, man, comfortable for them, but doesn't actually communicate love to you, it feels cheap. How many of you guys have ever gotten just like a card that says, happy birthday, here's $5 to Amazon. I didn't know what to get you. Yeah, maybe, maybe you get a little bit more money because your parents are a little bit, hey, here's some more money. But if you have someone who knows you, and knows your heart and knows things about you and they surprise you with a gift that communicates that knowledge, you feel a deeper sense of love from that person. But don't, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's easy and cheap to go to the, the store and buy a bunch of gift cards for all your friends for Christmas and say, here you go. But that's more communicative of, of your heart towards them than your knowledge of them. So we're going to look at how do we then love God well? So if you are here and you're like, hey, I don't, I don't believe in God. I don't know God. I'm not really sure he's worth loving. Well, then, yeah, this doesn't really apply to you. But if you're a Christian and you said like, I'm, I'm trusting God as my savior, Jesus Christ as my savior, but also as my Lord, meaning he's the ruler and uh, driver of my life, then this definitely applies to you and me. And so we have to ask ourselves then, man, how do we love God? Well, first and foremost, it requires a knowledge of God, but not just head knowledge, a deep intimacy. So we're going to look at four, four things that I want you guys to, to walk with me through. So it's this intimacy of God, not just this knowledge about God. 
I, I can know a lot of things about God. You probably know a lot of things about God. Bless you. You might know the 10 commandments. You might know every building on the North coast campus. You might know like the, the first five books of the Bible. How many of you guys know the first five books of the Bible? Anybody? Sweet. You don't need to be ashamed of that. But just because you might know things about God doesn't mean that you're close or you're intimate with him. In Mark chapter 12, man, Jesus says, is asked <coughs> this question. He says, hey, what are the, what's the greatest commandment? Well, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love others. And so, man, this idea of loving God with all, all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, like all of you is to, man, desire to be in an intimate relationship with him, not just to know things about him. We live in a generation where we can think we know people because we follow them on Instagram or TikTok. That's weird. You might know people very well because you know all this information about them because you are watching their life via Instagram, but there's no intimacy there. And sometimes I think we look at our faith that same way. We have an Instagram faith and we know things about God because we come and we listen to a, a post or we watch a story on, on Sunday or whatever, but we, we don't have any real relationship. We're not walking with God. Don't let your faith be an Instagram faith where you know things about God, but you're not walking with God. I remember I took this job um, a couple of years ago, a number of years ago, and I walked into the room and people knew things about me because they had stalked my wife's Instagram. I don't really have an Instagram. Like I think, and I think I, I think I do. I don't know if it's active anymore, guys. You could try to find it. I'm following one person, and that's my wife. And I think I posted like three pictures. But Carissa has, has an Instagram. And, and so these people were asking us questions about like, hey, man, so you have, you have a dog, right? Yeah. And uh, you, have, uh, you live in a trailer? Uh-huh. That's weird. How do you guys know all this stuff? So much like, hey, we saw your wedding video that was posted on the Facebook page. It's like, that's weird. And it's like, you can, you can know things about people and think that you have an intimate relationship with them, but you don't because they don't know you. Don't just know about God. Let God know you. Some of you guys are walking through Zoe 401 and we've asked you as you meditate on scripture, not just to, to get through the process of of reading something, but let that scripture sink into your soul. Let it know you. Let the word of God get through you. If you want to begin to, to have a, a loving relationship with God and to love God better, first and foremost, if you have not already, you have to recognize that you need him. And Jesus says it this way. He says, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. In Mark chapter eight, verse 34, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. Look, this word acedia is passive. It means I'm not gonna do anything. If you want to love God or you wanna love anybody, man, that's active. And so if you want to love God well, you first surrender to him and you walk with him and you learn to, to be intimate, to invite him into your life. And sometimes I think we, we make this look a lot different than it has to be. Guys, when you're in school or you're at home or you're wrestling with things, laying in bed or whatever, like you can have conversation with God. Just like you would text your friend and you roll over and you text your friend at night. Man, God wants to have a deep relationship with you. He wants to be with you, whether you're paying attention very well or not. I put it this way. I, I have a five-month-old son. We don't talk because he can't. But I like to spend time with him. And do you think that I ever get disappointed when he falls asleep in my arms? 
How many of you guys think I get disappointed when he falls asleep in my arms? Is that too rhetorical? You guys know what I mean? It's like, well, duh, you don't. Some of you guys think like, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna pray to God, but I'm, I'm, I always fall asleep. I always get distracted. It's not worth it, so I'm not gonna do it. God wants you to just to be with Him, even if you fall asleep in His arms. He wants you to go to Him, even if you don't know what you're gonna say. But it's active. It's active. You have to make that decision to go to him. In any relationship you've ever had, it's active. You have to make the decision to pursue that person or that person is making a decision to pursue you. But any relationship that's worth its weight is works both ways. So don't just settle for head knowledge. Don't just be content with coming here on Sunday or Wednesday and learning a bunch of facts about God and letting your head get bigger and bigger and bigger, but not actually walking with him and not actually knowing him. Second thing, you have to, we have to, not just you, we have to move from apathy or indifference to love and desire. Psalm 34 uh, talks about, man, taste and see that the Lord is good. How many of you guys have ever tasted really, really delicious food? What, what delicious food have you tasted? A steak. <laughs> I love steak. How many of you guys have had scallops wrapped in bacon before? Never? You guys should try it. It's really good. It's Lobster's really good too. When you taste something really good, man, you savor it and you want more of it. And if you're like me or you're like other foodies or you're like people that really like coffee or you're like people that are passionate about anything, man, there are people that don't stop talking about things and it can get really annoying. Maybe that's like how you feel about like me and Austin sometimes like, man, they never stop talking about Jesus. It's like, well, because we've tasted and we've seen that he's really good and he's really worth it. But you might have a friend who's like, oh my gosh, did you see the new Spider-Man? It's like so good. And you're like, dude, it's not that good. It's like, no, no, no. It's like really good. It's like, and you're like, oh my gosh, this dude never stops talking about the Marvel universe. It's like, get a life, bro. But it's like, (laughs) hey, hey, I'm just saying. We can get really excited about things that they consume us. And that's what we'll talk about because we've tasted and we've seen and we like that. That's good. Whether it's food, whether it's movies, whether it's a video game, whether it's a skateboard, whether it's like whatever, like a, a new guitar, Like there are things that you get passionate about that you get excited about that you talk to your friends about, at least I hope. Otherwise, I don't know what you talk about. You just stare at each other. What's up? How's life? It's good. And if that's your relationship, it's probably based in this, which is unwilling to do any hard work and just kind of coast. You know, if you're coasting, you're going downhill, right? If you're coasting, you're going downhill. Requires zero effort. Don't coast. Luke, in the gospel of Luke, um, we see Mary, this woman uh, who is desiring to to sit at Jesus's feet, to to dwell with him. And and her sister is doing all this work in their family and trying to prepare this meal. But this woman, Mary, has sat down and said, I just want to be with you, Jesus, because you're worth it, because you're worthy of it. Do you long to be with Jesus or are you apathetic about your faith. King David puts it this way, as a deer pants for water, so my soul, my soul thirsts for you. Do you actually have a desire? Do we actually have a desire to be with God so much that it would, that the the language of your heart would be like, my soul thirsts for God. Ask yourself this question right now. Take a second and think about it. Like, do I actually thirst for God? Do I actually believe that he's worth it? Or am I indifferent to him? And I'm just like, whatever, God, you're real. That's cool. But I don't really want you. I don't really feel like I need you. Guys, if you're actually thirsty, you drink water. 
you look for water. If you're not thirsty, then it doesn't really matter. And you go about your life and you'll drink whatever you want to in the moment. But if you're actually thirsty, you search for a drink. Do we desire God or are we apathetic? Do we expect things just to come to us? Are we so indifferent that we're like this word, Asidia, unwilling to do anything? Unwilling to pursue, unwilling to move. I think sometimes I am. I think sometimes I'm unwilling to do the hard work that love requires. And instead of pursuing God, I'll go home and I'll turn on the TV and I'll watch whatever. Like I can sit, I can sit and look at Disney plus and I can look at all of those movies, all of those things. And I can be like, man, there's nothing to watch because I've probably watched it all. That is so revealing of my soul. Like Disney Plus, you're like, there's so many things here. Or Netflix, it's like, there's nothing to watch. There's nothing on. It's like, because I've seen everything I want to watch. I'm unwilling to do the hard work. And instead I am coasting. Don't coast. Long for God. Be pursuing of God. That's the third thing. Purposeful pursuit over perfection. God does not need you, nor does he expect you to be perfect. In fact, he knows that you're not perfect. He knows that you're not going to be perfect. Look, if you accepted Jesus and you think that from now on you need to be perfect, well, then you have totally misunderstood why Jesus came in the first place because Jesus came because we could not be perfect. <coughs> the, the letter to the Galatians is Paul's argument to this church that says, Hey, you've accepted Christ. Now live in that knowledge. Don't try to earn your salvation because this whole church has fallen into this thought. Like we need to be perfect. We need to earn this, but instead walk in and live as a, a, a son or a daughter of, of Christ. Just be his and follow the pursuit. Put to, put to practice these things. Seek to be intimate with God. Seek to desire God. Seek to surrender to God. Seek to, man, trust God. But I think so often we, we think because we can't be perfect that we give up and we throw up our hands and we're like, well, it's not worth trying anymore. I'm too far gone. Or we think that like, well, I screwed up last night, so there's no way that I can, I can worship God on Sunday morning. Maybe that's, maybe that's you. Maybe there's stuff that you did last night, things that you were looking at, things you shouldn't have done, people you were hanging out, conversations you were having that were so far removed from God that you think right now that you can't be with him. And God invites you into a deeper relationship. And he says, hey, it's not about perfection. It's about pursuit. It's about actually blowing this word up and saying, I want to be a man or I want to be a woman who's going to take steps towards God every single day. Do you do that? Do you take steps towards God every single day? Or do you wake up in the morning not giving a freaking care? <laughs> like, is that how you wake up? Like, do you just wake up and like your day just kind of, you exist? Guys, don't just exist. You have to know that God loves you so much and there's such value in you, such care. And I don't care what other people say about you. I care about what God says about you. Some of you guys have no problem with self-esteem. Like, in fact, your heads are already huge. But some of you guys have like, man, really low self-esteem and you don't understand how valuable you are and how loved you are. And if your head is huge and you look at people as if they're not a big deal, then you have misunderstood the heart of God towards people. And if your head is small and you're deflated and you feel like there's no value in you, then you have misunderstood God's heart toward people. God is a God who pursues and he wants you to be a person who pursues him and pursues others. So would you have a purposeful pursuit as you walk through life instead of an apathetic appeal? Like you're just like indifferent. You don't really care what happens today. In fact, you didn't make the decision to come here. Your parents made it for you. Would you make decisions that point you towards Jesus? 
These are, these are some things that you can do. These are some tools that you can have that can point you towards Jesus. And if you're following in Zoe 1, then you might be walking through those. Man, you can study scripture. How many of you guys study scripture? That's what I thought. A few of us. Not just like read it, not just like, okay, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever has been born of God knows God. Cool, I read that, let's go. No, no, what does that mean? Like, are you willing to think critically? Do you guys know what that means to think critically? It means that you're going to do hard work to get to the bottom of things, not just accept everything that everyone tells you. In fact, I want you to think critically about this message. That way you can throw away the things that I say that aren't in agreement with God. And I pray that those are few, but I agree that there's probably things that I've said that aren't in agreement with God. Have you caught them? I'm not perfect. Are you paying attention? Do you think critically about your faith that you can be a, a person that, that pursues God? So man, to study scripture, and to ask yourself, beloved, what does that even mean? That I'm his beloved? That I'm the beloved of God? Let us love one another for love is from God. What does that mean? Do you ponder scripture? It's a tool. Do you go to church? Do you want to come to church to be around your brothers and sisters in Christ? Man, you're here. So that would lead me to believe that in some capacity, yes. Yes. Man, do you read scripture? Are you in a small group? Are you walking in repentance? These are all tools. Do you worship and sing? Like these are all tools to stir your affection, to move your heart towards Christ. These are purposeful things that you can do to move you towards Jesus and help align your heart towards Jesus. How do we love God? Well, we pursue him because he's worth being pursued. Last thing, obedience over agreement. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love God, you will keep his commandments. Some of you guys um, may listen to Larry Osborne's message this afternoon. Some of you guys may not, but he, um, man, he is speaking on King Saul and King David, and, and he's gonna use this word. He's gonna say, he's gonna say, um, Dang it, it just fell out of my head. Okay, like it's about walking man, with God in the relationship that you have with him. And there are house rules that God sets. Everyone is under the house rules that God sets. But your relationship with God can look different. The way that you relate to God can look different, but the house rules are the same. If I walk into your house and it's a shoes off at the door, those are the house rules. As you interact with your parents and your family within the house, that can look different, but you have to follow the rules. If we love God, if we love Christ, we will keep his commandments. Jesus, hey, deny yourself, take up your cross, put to death your desires and follow me. I'll put it this way. Sometimes I think we think that, all we want and all God wants for us is to be happy. Hey, God doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to be his. He wants you to know him. He wants you to do the hard work required. If I love my wife, then I'm gonna pursue her, not other women. If you saw me at the mall, or in downtown Vista, Best Pizza, which is delicious. If you saw me there with a, another woman and we were flirtatious and whatever, you would look at me and be like, freaking hypocrite. And there would be a part of you that says that is disgusting. And if you saw my wife, and if she walked in and she saw that, and I said to her, Carissa, don't you just want me to be happy? This makes me happy. Yeah, yeah, I love you, but this makes me happy. How many of you think my wife would be upset? How many of you guys would be upset for my wife? 
Why? Because it's wrong. Because she's worth it. Because that's her right as my wife. And sometimes I think we think that God doesn't have a right to be upset when we cheat on him. God desires obedience, not just agreement. I can agree like, yeah, like I'm supposed to love my wife and then I can do whatever I want. But God doesn't want you just to agree with him. He wants you to obey him, to follow him, to trust him. Look, the reason why that would bother you so much is because you know that the right thing is to honor and reflect her and that God doesn't care so much about my happiness, but about honoring and reflecting his love towards my wife. And while that might feel distasteful because it's challenging, maybe whatever I say my happiness is, though that's not for me at all, I think you get the idea. God wants us to walk in obedience to him, not just agree with him. Some of you, that might be the hardest thing. You might agree with what God says, but not walk in it. And this word, acedia, would agree. It would say, hey, it's not worth it. It's not that big of a deal. Look, if you want to love God, then you should trust him and obey him and pursue him and desire to be intimate with him, not just know about him. Don't take the apathetic road. Take a road of work. Guys, the hard things that you do in life are usually the better things that you do. If you do hard things intentionally driving you towards Jesus, I promise you, you will not be disappointed. If you coast, I don't know where you'll end up. But I promise you that it will not be as fulfilling or satisfying as a life as you could have as you follow Christ. Doesn't mean that following Christ isn't hard. Doesn't mean that following Christ isn't going to be difficult. It doesn't mean that if you follow Jesus, you're going to have everything you ever wanted. In fact, that might be as far away from it as, as you can imagine. God might call you to go to some difficult places. Like, would you believe that in this room, there might be some of you that are called to go to the Middle East to proclaim the gospel to a hostile people or to Indonesia? Do you believe that God could actually do that? Do you have confidence that God might do that? Or some of you guys might be pastors or teachers. Or some of you guys might be fathers or mothers physically to actual biological kids or spiritually to great, 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 great grandkids because of the way that you have pursued Christ intentionally that you've chosen to be intimate with God, not just know about God, that you've chosen to be purposeful in your pursuit, not apathetic, that you've chosen to obey, not just agree, that you've chosen to desire him, not be apathetic towards him. These are things that require choice, require action. You have four things that you can walk away with and choose to do or not do this week. But if you choose to not do them, then you are in agreement with this word saying, hey, he is not worth it to me. And this is not worth pursuing or giving myself to. That's revealing of your heart. If that is the case, would you be humble enough and wise enough to ask yourself, why do I not care? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for how you pursue us. God, would you give us hearts to pursue you in return? Would you give us a hunger for you? God, you have made it so easy to love you because you are so worth it and you've pursued us and you constantly do it. Would we have eyes to see that? Would our affection be stirred? And would we be people who are motivated to walk to know you deeper and better? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.